to um, give people a little bit of extra time to gather. Um, sure. We, are, we already have 28 participants, so I, normally we start at about five after, just to give people that wiggle room. Okay, that's fine. Right, so that's about four minutes from now. All right, all right, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Me? Uh, I'll be right here, just whenever, <laughs> whenever. <the> <laughs> Are they a good snacking tomato? They look really beautiful. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're great. They're they're about the same size as a regular uh, grape tomato, and um, you know it, it, they uh, they really uh, taste very you know just like a red grape tomato, but they have this unique kind of um, you know, a color pattern to them, hmm. and uh, and I think they have a unique flavor too. That's uh, I, I'm not going to show the slide that has the the volatile. Um, metagram on it because I think it's a little too technical but you know it's uh, it's it's an excellent tasting and, and good snacking um, you know just like most of the grape grape tomatoes it's not terribly different it's just as has a different color to it mm -hmm. well it's really pretty and it has a few other um, attributes I think that are um, desirable for gardening oh great our dog Ruby likes snacking tomatoes. Oh! Well, tell Ruby to go on the website and get uh, some seeds. And <laughs> I didn't realize until um, earlier this year that my chickens love tomatoes. I had no idea. Aww. Yeah, I've got. I have. I have chickens actually, and uh, what I found with chickens is they get tired of anything if you give them uh, the same thing over and over again. Right. But um, if, you take, if you give them tomatoes like once a week, they, they, they'll go after them. Uh, I think they'll go after anything, really, the first time. Yeah, I mean, they seem particularly partial to watermelon, but I think oh, yeah. tomatoes are a close second. Yeah, yeah I think they're, they're, they seem very omnivorous. I think, uh, you know, chickens, it seems to me there's not much they won't eat. <laughs> All right, a couple more minutes. We're still getting a lot of joiners, so. All right, well, you don't want to leave anybody out here, so whenever you want to go is fine with me. Yeah, so before we get started, um, Amanda's right, she's putting it in the chat, but we should um, maybe actually, uh, Laura, you should play the video one more time. So we can thank our donors and sponsors and such. I think the way that my screen sharing is currently set up, I'll have to end the screen share in order to show the video, but I can. No, 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 it's all right. You can just leave it. Um, but then we should, uh, okay, so let's get started. Okay, so welcome everyone um, to the fifth session in our one week celebration of tomatoes in New Jersey. We're uh, thrilled you could all join again. And um, I see there's a lot of people who are coming back for another session. So we really appreciate that. Um, today we have Professor Tom Orton, um, who is in our plant biology department at Rutgers. And he's gonna be sharing um, his new tomato, the Scarlet Sunrise, which we're very excited about. And um, he's also gonna be talking about um, breeding tomatoes and, and all kinds of different things. So I will turn it over to Tom and welcome Tom. So thank you very much for joining us, Tom. And um, uh, I think in general, I'll just remind everyone that we're gonna go ahead and mute everybody until um, we open up for questions. So if you have a question and you wanna ask it right away for clarification or whatever, um, you can put it in the chat and um, Amanda will be man managing the chat throughout the session so she can make sure your questions are answered. Okay, so over to Amanda, our host, and Tom, who's going to be speaking on tomatoes. All right. Well, hi there. I'm so happy to see everybody again. I would love to introduce uh, 
uh, Tom, who's a professor at Rutgers, which is my soon-to-be alma mater, so I'm very excited to uh, hear his guest lecture today. Um, and he's going to be telling us all about a new variety of tomato called the Scarlet Sunrise. So Tom, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then the topic of today, we'll get started. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Orton. I'm a, a faculty member at, uh, at Rutgers uh, in the Department of Plant Biology on the old Cook campus. Uh, but I'm actually physically located um, in South Jersey. That's where I'm actually connecting to you right now from down um, near Bridgeton, New Jersey. Uh, I'm actually in, in Salem County. So I'm, I'm quite a distance away. I, was, I, I came up for the Festimato last year physically and gave a talk and really enjoyed it. So it's a, it's a shame that we can't all, all get together and, uh, and, uh, and share seeds and do things like that. I think I gave away seeds last year. Um, but uh, you know, maybe there's a way that we can, uh, we can share some seeds at the end. I'll maybe work with uh, the, the NOFA folks and see what, what we can do. But what I want to talk about today is uh, a new uh, new grape tomato that uh, myself and, and a colleague have developed by, by uh, named, of course, Scarlet, Scarlet Sunrise. It was just uh, released uh, for uh, general distribution this year, earlier this year. Um, so, uh, and, and we're, we're excited about it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's unique and I think it's, it's something that will fit very well in, um, in, in New Jersey gardens. Uh, so let's let's go on to the next slide. All right. So that's sometimes it, it's it's difficult to capture this unique color of the fruit. In this uh, slide, it looks the fruit looks almost monolithically orange, uh, but actually the uh, the color pattern is more of a sort of a stippled red uh, over yellow background, and so it's it's almost more peachy if I can maybe make a, an apt comparison. Uh, that's about the closest comparison that I can, I can really uh, come to. But um, other than that, it uh, it's, behaves more or less like a, a, uh, like a typical uh, grape tomato. Uh, those of you who have grown grape tomatoes, uh, you know, this would, be, this would fit in and, and all the cultural practices would be very similar to what you're already doing with um, the commercial cultivars that you're, you're already growing. Um, we have uh, applied, myself and Peter Nietzsche, who is uh, the co-inventor uh, for a plant uh, variety protection certificate, um, and this will just give us uh, the ability to uh, have some con control over, you know, the population, where it goes, and, and how it's uh, propagated. Um, you know, we're not looking at this as a, as a big commercial venture or anything like that. In fact, this is a, an open pollinated cultivar, and so once we uh, release it, um, the, uh, the gardeners that, that produce it can actually save their own seeds and, and they don't have to keep buying seeds uh, year after year. So that you can propagate your own seeds and uh, um, unlike uh, F1 hybrid bird cultivars, and we'll talk about that in the coming slides, the difference between open pollinated types and F1s. I still get that question quite a bit, so I wanted to maybe take this opportunity for in this talk to, to, to cover that a little bit. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so um, this is, uh, this slide has animation. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, plant breeding strategies in a very basic way. So uh, we have, you know, some understanding of, of how Scarlet Sunrise was developed relative to, to some of the other cultivars that are out there. So uh, if you hit the advanced button again, we'll go to the first bullet. Um, the traditional strategy is uh, quite simply we, uh, a plant breeder acquires a lot of different forms of a crop that look different and then screens them for, uh, for the types that they want to find parents that will contribute uh, desirable genes and hybridizes them and allows natural sexual mechanisms to sort the genes out between them. And, uh, and hopefully you'll take the best of both parents that will... Uh, segregate and, and recombine together and the plant breeder selects those and, and uh, that becomes a new cultivar. So that's that's really traditional breeding. That's what we've been doing um, for uh, about the last 120 years and actually uh, it's a 
in a more primitive sense, all the way back to uh, the beginnings of agriculture uh, that led to uh, the domestication of all of our crops were, were done this way. Just uh, selecting the, the desirable plants, taking the, the offspring from those desirable plants that will tend to, uh, to resemble their parents. And then over many generations, you'll Im improve the population. Um, okay, hit, let's hit the advance one more time. Now, of course, technology is having a big impact on plant breeding. Everybody uh, is, is probably aware of that. And, and uh, one of the, the ways it's kind of non-obtrusive is something called marker-assisted breeding. And uh, this is a way to use molecular biology to speed this traditional breeding along. And the way it's done is to find um, molecular markers. So these are just, you know, um, dots on a gel. Uh, and depending on what they look like, uh, you know, you can use them as markers, uh, just like you could, you know, with, uh, with any trait like height or color or anything like that. But they're much easier to work with than, uh, than whole plant traits like color and, and weight and things like that. So uh, the, uh, find molecular markers that are linked to desirable genes very closely. And then we can use those molecular markers as, as surrogates to select for rare uh, desirable genetic recombinants. Uh, and that's really what the, the seed industry is, is doing a lot of now is, is this marker-assisted breeding. They're, they're very busily finding molecular markers that tag on to things like disease resistance and yield and grain quality and fruit quality, and then selecting for the markers uh, in the laboratory as opposed to going out in the field uh, and, and selecting for some of these complex traits, which sometimes um, don't really reveal themselves in, in, a, in a reliable way. All right, let's, let's advance one more. All right, this is uh, the GMO. And for, for the folks that are in the organic uh, uh, agriculture world, uh, you know, GMOs are pr probably uh, not uh, something that, that's in the system very much, but they're still around. Uh, and this is, a, this is a, tr a plant breeding strategy that's been used since about the early 1990s. Uh, and it involves linking finding genes, linking them to uh, uh, a plasmid that's in, a, in a, a pathogenic bacterium. And that bacterium actually injects the gene right into the, the genome of the host plant. Uh, and so it's, uh, sometimes there's, there's some undesirable uh, DNA that goes along with that, uh, including things like antibiotic uh, resistance. And so, uh, so this can have uh, you know, some undesirable consequences. And of course, uh, GMO is, uh, there's, there are labeling requirements and other re regulations that have to be adhered to by using this technology. Uh, and it's also highly um, uh, <clears throat> protected uh, you know, by patents. And so somebody like a small breeder like myself, I, I don't use much of this because I can't afford to pay the license fee. So everything we do is, is uh, the, the number one traditional strategy and maybe with a little bit of marker assisted if, if uh, we can make that work. Uh, and then the, the final, let's uh, advance one more time. Um, many of you may have read about a new technology called genome editing, or uh, and, and the main tool that's used for that is something called CRISPR-Cas9. And CRISPR-Cas9 is a bacterial uh, nuclease system that can, uh, if you engineer it, can actually allow you to go into the, to the genes that are in an organism and change them. You can actually edit them. Uh, and so, and it doesn't necessarily leave behind any footprint at all. It just goes in and takes a gene and, and changes, like if you have, you know, have blue eyes, change it to brown eyes. Uh, and so this is something that's relatively new um, over the last about three or four years. Uh, and I, I'm, I think there are a couple of examples of where it's actually come to fruition. Uh, and I'm actually working on this in, a, in, in one project in, in grapes. I'm not doing it in tomatoes uh, where it can't be done. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, can't be done with traditional breeding. Um, but the, those um, the, the three latter uh, strategies there, the marker assisted breeding, GMO and, and genome editing are mainly applied to, to commercial uh, crop cultivars and not so much uh, for, for gardening varieties. And uh, at Rutgers, uh, and uh, the breeding programs at, at Rutgers predominantly uh, were, were aiming um, for uh, cultivars that will 
can be used as germplasm or can be used in, in the garden um, you know, by home gardeners. And so, uh, so everything we've done is, is traditional and there, there's nothing that is, uh, is subject to any regulation. Okay, next slide. Another question I get is uh, the difference between open pollinated cultivars and F1 hybrids. Uh, when you read through the uh, seed catalogs, it's sometimes difficult to get factual information. Uh, you get a lot of rosy information about the performance of, of this cultivar and that cultivar. But, um, so what, what are the differences between an F1 hybrid cultivar and an open pollinated cultivar? That uh, if you're a gardener, why would you want to get one or the other? Um, well, first of all, let's let's advance first to uh, one time to the F1 hybrid. Uh, so in an F1 hybrid population, the seeds are derived from the pollination of one parent line by a second line. Um, so you have two parents that um, essentially give rise to the progeny, just like in humans, for example, where you have a mother and a father. And the uh, F1 hybrid uh, would be uh, the cross or a hybrid between those two parents. Um, in the case of uh, some crops, it's it's a very efficient and and uh, and relatively easy way to uh, to do it. For example, in um, corn, corn is relatively easy to uh, to breed as an F1 hybrid. Tomato is not. Tomato is difficult, uh, mainly because the, the the actual crosses between the, the plants have to be done by hand. In corn, it's all done by wind pollination, whereas in, in tomato, it's not. Uh, and for that reason, uh, F1 hybrid seed in tomato, uh, tomatoes is, is extremely expensive. Uh, it, it takes a lot of labor and, and uh, it's no surprise that a lot of the seeds are, are produced uh, overseas where the labor is, is cheaper. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in, in energy efficiency and zero uh, carbon footprint, uh, hybrids are, 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 are not fitting into the efficient category because you're taking parent seeds, sending them way over to Asia, and then shipping the, the product back uh, you know, to, uh, to Europe and, and to North America to be planted. Uh, most new cultivars are F1 hybrids uh, that you see in, in the seed catalogs. They're aimed at capture of, of hybrid vigor. I think everybody um, listening probably has some idea what what I'm talking about with hybrid vigor or heterosis, and crop uniformity, since uh, the parents are inbreds. And inbred means that um, everything, uh, there's no genetic variability. Uh, and so uh, they tend to be more uniform, uh, hybrids and, and inbreds. Um, hybrids make it easy to combine multiple sources of disease resistance. And in tomatoes, that is a, a real advantage. Uh, um, where you have uh, dominant major genes that uh, confer resistance, you can put easily put many of them together in, in one single population using uh, F1 hybrids. Unfortunately, you cannot propagate them sexually because they segregate. The, uh, if you try to save seeds from an F1 hybrid, the next generation will be very highly variable and will not resemble um, the, uh, the F1 hybrid population. All right, let's go to the next uh, stop here. Open pollinated populations, their seeds are derived from uncontrolled pollination of many individuals within a single population. And for that reason, it's, since it's uncontrolled, it's relatively inexpensive. And most heirloom uh, tomatoes are, are OPs. So this is more kind of traditional technology. Um, the populations are usually less uniform uh, than F1 hybrids. In tomatoes, that's not always the case. Since tomatoes are self-pollinating, Many OP uh, tomato cultivars are actually quite uniform, so that, that's not uh, that's that's not a major um, issue with tomatoes. Um, it's more difficult to combine uh, disease resistance uh, for in OPs than it is with F1 hybrids. Um, but you know, uh, I gave a talk last year at the Fest Tomato on uh, the use of, of dominant major uh, resistance genes and the, the danger of doing that. And, uh, and that is the, the source of, of disease resistance that is, uh, is used by plant breeders uh, in, when they, they synthesize these F1 hybrids. And, uh, you know, so at, at Rutgers, we, at least in, in uh, the tomato program, we tend to try to focus on more multigenic forms of, of disease resistance that'll be more stable. Uh, some of these uh, monogenic resistance 
systems uh, tend to be very unstable. Um, the, the best thing about OPs is that you can propagate them sexually. So you get to the end of the season, you can actually save seeds. You don't have to go out and, and spend, you know, five, ten dollars for a packet of seed next year. Um, okay, so next slide. All right, so that's uh, that's my colleague Pete Nietzsche in the in the photo there, and he's holding a, a handful of uh, of uh, scarlet sunrise tomatoes, um, probably the same ones, probably the same hands you saw a couple of slides ago. Uh, so let's advance. I think we have animation in this one, so I think we have to advance um, to the ne next stop here. So if we could advance one. All right, so uh, this uh, Scarlet Sunrise is actually Pete's vision, Peter's vision, to develop a, a unique tomato based on uh, a fruit color that he observed back in about 2010 of a cultivar called Isis Candy. And that's uh, an open pollinated cherry tomato cultivar. Um, and he wanted to move that fruit color um, that you saw pictures of already from Isis Candy into uh, a grape tomato. Uh, mainly because there were, were some problems quality-wise with, uh, with, with Isis candy that it couldn't be used directly. Um, we wanted to combine it with uh, fruit firmness in particular and better flavor uh, of another uh, grape tomato cultivar called uh, SCM 9137, Seminus 9137. That's a red uh, grape tomato cultivar that we tested over many years and, and found it to be a superior Cultivar. Unfortunately, the company uh, doesn't sell it anymore. But you know, it's uh, we do have populations of it at Rutgers, but um, it's not available commercially, unfortunately. Okay, next next slide. And it was, uh, to be an open pollinator. So these are the, the the parents that we wanted to use in this breeding program. On the left, uh, on you see, SEM ninety one thirty seven, the the red grape, um, typical red grape that has, uh, it's very firm, the fruit are very firm, and they don't crack. Uh, so they're crack resistant and they have very high flavor. And by flavor, I'll say right now that uh, predominantly we, we select for high fruit acidity and high fruit sugar. So they have high acids and high sugar. So, um, so you have sort of like the, the sour with the, the sweet uh, together. Um, and we cross that, we made a hybrid with Isis candy, which is that uh, open pollinated cherry um, on the right there that you see has that, uh, that kind of peachy look to it. Uh, but it's very soft. It's, uh, you can very easily squeeze it and, and it bursts open uh, and just kind of explodes. It has very bland flavor. Uh, there's not much to it. Uh, the yield is low and mainly it's, it's crack susceptible. These, uh, the crack, fruit cracking in small fruited tomatoes like Grapes and, and cherries is a problem. When it rains, you know, the most of the of the fruit can can get cracked and start to rot right away, and you lose the entire um, load of fruit that's on a plant very quickly. A summer like we're having right now is is wreaks havoc on on um, soft uh, grape and, ch and cherry tomatoes. But uh, this uh, cultivar here, this SCM 9137, is very very crack resistant. It can rain and rain and nothing happens. All right, so next slide. You can hear this is what the cracks look like um, after, after a rain, let's say a couple of days, and it dries off, and then these cracks form. Um, just to give you a, just to show you what, and also kind of a good shot of what the color looks like in Isis candy, the, the grape, uh, the, uh, the, the cherry tomato parent. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, so what was done was to cross SEM 9137 with Isis candy, and, uh, and this is done by taking pollen from one of the parents and then putting it on the stigma of the other parent. Um, next slide. The stigma then, the, the pollen uh, of the of parent one uh, germinates and uh, grows down to style uh, fertilizes the egg of the of the second parent, and uh, the, the embryo inside the seeds produces uh, hormones that cause the fruit to grow. That's that's the uh, the ovary, the old ovary of the flower. 
And so you can see here, a small fruit starting to form from a cross that was made uh, probably uh, a couple of weeks previous uh, to, uh, to this, the one that the shot was taken. So uh, this is relatively easy to do in, in tomatoes, but um, to make hybrid seed, you have to do this hundreds and thousands of times to get enough seed to produce a commercial seed. So it can become tedious. Next slide. And then when the fruits are ripe, uh, everybody knows what a tomato looks like when you cut it in half. It's got uh, locules or kind of like open parts of the fruit that are filled with a jelly-like substance that contain these seeds. Uh, and you just have to kind of get the, 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 the gel-like substance away from the seeds and um, wash them and, and dry them down and then you'll have seeds for next year. Um, and so we, uh, that's, that's relatively easy, easy to do. Anybody can do it at home. Uh, and so this is uh, you know, something that uh, we're gonna publish a, uh, uh, a fact sheet uh, that'll go on the, the Rutgers uh, website uh, so people will have uh, access to the, the process of, of how to produce uh, tomato and, and seeds and, and, and probably a few other vegetables as well. All right, next slide. All right, so uh, this is a little bit of a busy slide. I'll, I'll try to walk you through it real quick. Just shows the timeline. We made this cross, we, we started in 2011 by taking the SEM 9137, which was a, an F1 hybrid cultivar, to make it into an inbred, we selfed it and selected it twice. Uh, so in the summer of 2012, we had something called SEM 9137C, which was an inbred version of SEM 9137. And then that was hybridized uh, with Isis candy. So we had an F1 hybrid between those two uh, as of winter 2012, 2013. Then that hybrid was successively self-pollinated and selected over many, many generations until we, we uh, selected in uh, about uh, 2016, the, the progenitor of, of what actually came to be, to be called uh, Scarlet Sunrise. Uh, we've got two versions of that, as you can see in summer 2016, that we had 25.1 and 25.2, and we'll talk about 25.2 in a minute. 25.1 is what became Scarlet Sunrise. Um, Self, self just means self-pollination, which tomato is naturally self-pollinated. Just uh, the, uh, the pollen of the same plant pollinates its, its own flower. Uh, but the, when I say selection, the selection criteria that we're used is over on the right-hand side of the slide. We, uh, we selected for a semi-determinate growth habit that's a smaller plant, mid uh, to late maturity. You don't want things that are too late. Um, but if you have things that are too early, they, they sometimes they lack flavor because they, they don't have enough foliage. And, uh, and so in that, line, in that vein, we've selected for strong foliage, high concentrated yield, tolerance to bacterial pathogens, uh, which are the main problems uh, in uh, the mid-Atlantic uh, part of the, of the North America is bacterial pathogens and early blight, not the same pathogens that, uh, that are common in, in the South and in California. Firmness was a big one, resistance to cracking, and then flavor was a, was a big uh, selection criteria, the, the, you know, high sugars and high acids. And we also did some selection for tomato flavor, which is the volatiles. Um, but we won't spend a whole lot of time on that. Okay, next slide. All right, so just to show you, uh, you know, this is for the results of a taste test. Many of you have probably been to, to the great tomato tasting event at the Snyder Farm that's held every August. I think Pete Nietzsche, who oversees that event, is going to try to do something this year. Again, uh, you know, with the pandemic, it's, it's going to be certainly a, a big challenge. But this is the results of a tasting that was done in 2012 with uh, several different uh, grape tomato cultivars, just to show the range in uh, the consumer preference, broken down according to sweetness, acidity, flavor, texture, uh, you know, and this is a fairly large uh, sample of the 140 individuals. Uh, you know, this was, this predates uh, our, um, the development of, of uh, Scarlet Sunrise. And, uh, but I can tell you that the SCM 9137, which isn't on this slide, but it, I'm sure it would be at 
or near the, the top as far as, as consumer preference. It was a, it's, it's definitely a, has an excellent flavor profile. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Um, it is a, uh, the, the, the growth habit of Scarlet Sunrise ended up uh, being more or less uh, indeterminate. Um, and so you see this uh, individual harvesting uh, fruits from um, a breeding line that, that became Scarlet Sunrise. And you can see that this is a relatively tall plant, uh, tomato in the tomato world, and it has to be grown on uh, very long stakes to, to stake it up. Otherwise, uh, they sprawl all over the ground. It's a big mess. So uh, gardeners that are going to grow this, I, I recommend that you get you know, good, stout, long, uh, eight-foot stakes and, um, and put those into the ground and, and, uh, and, and train it onto the stakes uh, you know, to get the best results. Uh, by comparison, you can see what's called a semi-determinant large-fruited tomato on the, on the left. Um, so, you know, you can see the stature difference there. So an indeterminate on the right, semi-determinant on the left. Okay, next slide. And uh, the determinate types tend to be earlier, too. You can see the, uh, the comparison here, the determinate type of actually SEM 9137, uh, all kind of flowering. Uh, you know, the plants are, tend to be shorter, and they, they tend to flower all at the same time. They also tend, since they don't have a, a heavy uh, foliage, uh, not to have very good flavor. The foliage is necessary to produce the sugars that go into the fruits. So if you don't have a lot of foliage, the fruits tend to be bland. Uh, indeterminates are a little bit more difficult to manage, but the, the flavor of the fruits is outstanding because you have so much foliage. Um, and they also produce fruits over a, a prolonged period of time. Uh, so you can get fruits uh, starting in early July, and it'll continue to produce, produce fruits all the way into early November. Uh, and, and you can get good harvests almost every week. Uh, it produces continuously. Okay, next slide. All right, so uh, the derivatives, as we were selfing this cross between SEM 9137 and Isis Candy, these are the sorts of, of colors that, that come out uh, of, with regard to the fruit. Uh, and so you can see there's a lot of red fruits, a lot of, a lot of red populations in there. The reason for that is that uh, red fruit is dominant over yellow or, or stippled fruit. So if you cro cross a yellow with a red, the F1 hybrid will be red. Uh, but as you self them, uh, the, uh, the, the yellow and the bicolor types segregate out from the red. And you see very interesting types. We, we have some types that are pure yellow, others that have, a, have uh, some red blush to them. And we even saw some that had uh, you know, some, some darker colors, some purple uh, colors. You can kind of see one in the second row to the left. It's a red that has a little bit of a dark skin to it. So there's a lot of segregation that can occur when you cross two things together that are quite different. Um, and the uh, Scarlet Sunrise, I think, is over on the second row from the top on the far right. Okay. All right, next slide. All right, so this is what happened then. Uh, we, we saw the part, the start of the slide before. We crossed uh, SCM 9137 with Isis Candy, the bland, uh, crack susceptible, low yield cherry tomato. And then uh, after many generations of selfing, we selected this line called TG25.1C that was firm, had high flavor, high yield, and very crack resistance, resistant. resistant. And this is what um, was tested further and uh, you know, turned out to be very highly consistent in its uh, performance. And, and so it was, uh, was we decided to release it in um, the end of 2019, produce seeds last year, and, uh, and was officially, officially released uh, in January of this year. Okay, ne next slide. Now, Scarlet Sunrise is on the left here, and uh, remember back to that earlier slide that showed all the generations on a kind of a um, Excel spreadsheet one, the 25.2 that we selected in, in 2016 is on the right, and you can see it's slightly darker uh, than the Scarlet Sunrise, but otherwise it's very similar. 
the Scarlet Sunrise. And so we're working on that one now as a prospective uh, subsequent release, kind of a follow-up release to be called Scarlet Sunset. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we're still working on that one. That one's not quite finished yet, but the, the Scarlet Sunrise is the one that's available. Um, they are indeterminate. Uh, they have mid-late maturity, firm fruits, uh, resistant to cracking, resistance to cracking, uh, very high fruit sugars, high fruit uh, organic acids, and uh, a relatively mild uh, tomato flavor. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, what are we looking at here? Well, um, <clears throat> when you cross two different things together, uh, you know, the, the, the genes that are in one parent versus the other kind of tend to mix in uh, the, the progeny. Just like if, uh, if two people uh, get together and have children, the children aren't exactly like the parents. They're kind of like halfway between. Well, after, this is after many generations, uh, going back and finding the genes that came from either Isis Candy or um, SCM9137. And uh, in uh, Scarlet Sunrise, which is the same as TG25.1C, we see that um, ha about half the genes that are in that new cultivar, Scarlet Sunrise, came, came from Isis Candy, the, the cherry um, bicolor type, and about half uh, of the genes came from SCM9137. So it's about 50-50. Uh, and of course, we were looking for fruit firmness and flavor from SCM9137, and we were looking mainly for color from uh, Isis Candy. But this is uh, kind of the way it, um, um, it, it uh, segregated here. So, uh, so this is, yeah, this is uh, what we wanna see in plant breeding is that you're taking both, taking genes from both parents combine them together and uh, created something that was better than, than either parent. All right, um, next slide. All right, so uh, we're getting close to the end. I'm gonna obviously finish a little bit earlier here and we'll, that'll give us some time for, for questions. Um, so let's hit the, the advance one more time. All right, so what uh, the conclusions from what we did was uh, that we were able to combine the desirable attributes of, of these two parent cultivars. Uh, and the, the attributes that we targeted were the, the bicolor fruit type, firmness in the fruits, resistance to cracking under moisture stress, and high, high flavor, both sugar and, and organic acids. So that was done successfully. Uh, okay, uh, let's advance it one more. Um, <clears throat> Now we did compare the volatile content. This is a, uh, what makes a tomato taste like a tomato are what's called these volatile compounds. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to tell it from a peach. Peach has totally different volatile um, makeup than tomatoes. And so it's, and it's very specific to tomato. But if we compare the volatile content of Scarlet Sunrise versus uh, SEM 9137, which is the very high flavor red type. So it's, it's they both have good flavor, but they're different, is a, what I can say about it. Um, so it's a matter of preference, I guess, but um, as I said, it's a mild tomato flavor. I think SEM 9137 has more intense tomato flavor. Okay, next, uh, let's advance it one more. Um, it's genetically fixed. That means it's, homo it's, it's inbred. It breeds true. Uh, you know, if you grow out 100 plants, they all look the same. So um, if we grow out 1,000 plants, we might see one or two that look, look a little different. But uh, for all intents and purposes, it's, uh, it's highly uniform. All right, next slide. Next, uh, let's advance it one more click. Uh, and it's about half, half the genes came from one parent and half the genes from the other parent based on uh, these uh, molecular markers that we, that we use to, to identify the genomic segments of the parents. Um, all right, let's uh, uh, advance one more. Now, okay, so if you want to get seeds, you can go straight to Rutgers. Uh, and for nominal fee and, and some shipping, uh, you can buy seeds of Scarlet Sunrise. Um, you can you can see the uh, the, uh, the the web address there, and 
and uh, that web page will also contain um, a list of other uh, seeds of other cultivars that uh, are, are carried by by Rutgers in what's called the Rediscovering the, the Jersey Tomato Project, and they, they include large fruited types mainly, Ramapo, Rutgers 250, Scarlet Sunrise is a new one, the, the grape tomato, Moriton, AC146. Those are all tomatoes that were grown during the golden era of uh, the Jersey tomato in uh, in New Jersey. And uh, to one extent or another, were considered to be the Jersey tomato. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I should say one thing about flavor uh, is that if you get 10 people in the room and ask them to taste tomatoes, no, they won't agree. There, there won't, will not be any agreement about what, what the, the best tomato is. Uh, we, you know, you see that over and over again, and it's probably mainly due to these volatile compounds. Um, they are uh, perceived differently by different people. Their palate just is, is different. Uh, and so it's, it's difficult to do this work. That's part of the reason that we focus on uh, selecting uh, only for sugars and acids, because they, that tends to be much more of a uh, <clears throat> of a consensus. Uh, so if you get high sugars and high acids in a, in a fruit, um, you tend to get more of a consensus of agreement that, that there's good flavor. Uh, you can also get seeds in larger uh, quantities from Roar Seed, which is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, there's the URL for the, for uh, for Roar, uh, and uh, they have Scarlet Sunrise uh, that was packaged. Uh, Roar also sells to transplant producers in, um, in New Jersey. Um, that web page from Rutgers uh, does have uh, a fairly comprehensive list of the transplant um, retailers where you can buy transplants of all these, these, uh, these New Jersey cultivars as well. You can't find most of these uh, in, in other seed catalogs. So uh, these are, are tomatoes that are specific to the heritage of growing tomatoes in New Jersey. Um, okay, next slide. And I think that's that's it. That's really, uh, I can open up for questions now. We're going to end a little bit early, and uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, that's unusual for me because I, I'm usually pretty pretty talkative and, uh, and tend to, to push the, the, the time a little bit. So, so this, is, uh, this is fine with me. Hopefully uh, we can get some good questions and I'll be pleased to answer those. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, thank you so much. This is perfect because we do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one of them uh, from Brett, he's asking how you uh, actually gather the pollen. Well, uh, what, what you can do is, uh, so you're going to have two parents. Uh, you're going to have the female parent that you're going to make the cross onto, and you're going to have the male parent. That's where you get the pollen from. Uh, the day before you want to make the cross, you take... Uh, uh, flowers of the male parent and dry them. Uh, usually you can just just take the, the, the anthers out, the anthers of the yellow part of the flower, the, not, not the petals, but the yellow uh, uh, cone part of the, of the flower. So if you remove those and put them in, into uh, in like a dish or a tray or something, let them sit overnight until they dry completely. Um, the next day uh, you can actually, you can um, macerate or, or sort of uh, crush uh, those dried anthers and when you do that it, uh, the, 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 the pollen will pour out of the anthers and it's relatively easy to pick it up with a, with a paintbrush or any kind of a really any you can you can use almost anything to pick the pollen up it's pretty sticky and uh, and move it from that dish or tray or whatever where you put the anthers onto the stigma of the female parent Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Barbara also had a couple of questions, so I'm just gonna rapid fire them, but are you familiar with the Juliet uh, tomato? And if yes. so, how does it compare to this? Well, um, I'm sure it compares well. I don't, I hate to, to make generalizations without having you know, uh, you know, some kind of trial uh, data in front of me. I'm sure that uh, I know that my colleague, Peter Nietzsche, has grown Juliet a lot um, and that we've had it in, in taste tests. I don't have the data in front of me. All I can say is that I'm sure it compares well uh, you know, if, uh, 
if there's a if there's a lot of interest in, in that specific comparison, I can probably get some uh, some information uh, that you know will aside from just guessing you know that it's uh, that they are comparable. Since I don't have the numbers in front of me, I, I can't say specifically, but um, uh, I know that from our experience that both SEM 9137 and Scarlet Sunrise tend to be at or near the top uh, every year of all the grape tomatoes that we grow and test, in, including Juliet. But, you know, the, the specific comparisons, uh, I just, I don't have it the, the, the tip of my fingers right now. Fair enough, yeah. Um, so what what is their size and uh, what's the ability that they can dehydrate as well? Okay. Well, the size is, is typical of a grape tomato, and, and they're, you know, usually about in the range of between 8 and, and 12 grams per fruit. And, and by comparison, a plum tomato would be probably about 80 grams, and a um, large fruited tomato would probably be between two and 300 grams. So, uh, so that's uh, most of the tomatoes like Smarty and Juliet, they're, they're in that range, about 10 grams. Uh, so it's comparable. Fair enough. Um, and would it be too late um, to direct seed uh, for, uh, sorry, let me just reread this. Would it be too late uh, to direct seed a few of these this year? So is it too late to order them or is it too, or is it too late to, to retrieve the seeds now? Um, you mean to get uh, uh, some kind of crop uh, in time before the end of the 2020 season? I, I believe that was her, her intention to ask, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's too late. Uh, it's, when I say mid-late, it's going to take probably 90 to 100 days to get a crop. Uh, you know, that's going to take us from now, you know, we're sitting at the middle of August. That's going to take us well into, uh, you know, October, November. So um, the problem, you know, with uh, tomatoes is that um, they'll do well into uh, all the way into about late September, but then we get cool nights into the 40s and 50s. And uh, tomatoes do not like 40s and 50s. Right. And they, they, don't, they, they hate 30s even more. But um, 40s and 50s will bring on the diseases. It'll weaken the plants. Um, I, you know, if you have some kind of way to cover it, uh, you know, maybe put it in, in the garden. And if, if you can put, you know, if you have a, like a, a plastic covering or something so you can artificially elevate the temperature, keep the night temperature up, you know, that it could work. It'll be a lot of it'll be a lot of work, frankly, to do that. You're probably better off to wait till next year, or if you have a greenhouse, to to put it in large pots and grow it over the winter. We've done that, and uh, it, it it can be done. All right. Uh, and Stephanie would like to know uh, how do you continue to produce seed if hybrids do not breed true? Uh, so what's done with hybrids is to increase seeds of the two parents. So if a seed company wants to produce, um, you know, say a thousand pounds of, of F1 hybrid seed, they have to produce seeds of both parents and then send uh, enough seeds of both parents uh, to wherever the, the, the cross is being made, usually in China or India or Thailand. Uh, you know, and so, in order to increase the, the hybrid, there's only one way, and that's to increase the parent. And, uh, and then, um, you know, produce more seeds, more parents, and then send the parents again, more parents next year, and produce more seeds. Uh, so it's, uh, so then instead of worrying about just one population, you have to worry about both, both parents. Right, right. Um, and uh, Joe would like to know if Rutgers is working on a new large beef steak tomato like the 250. Yeah, we're working on, on uh, some derivatives of, of uh, Rutgers 250 that have uh, addressed some of the issues, some of the problems that we had with Rutgers 250, which are minor, but uh, they're, they're there. Um, uh, Rutgers 250 is also um, an open pollinated type, uh, and we're working on a hybrid version. Uh, and uh, we're making some progress on that. Progress is, is slow. It's probably going to be a year or two before we get uh, the next version of that out, but we are working on it, yes. Awesome. Oh, I'm excited about that. Um, and then Stephanie also has another question of, um, is this um, cultivator resistant to early blight? 
we selected uh, the segregating populations for resistance to uh, to bacterial pathogens and, and whatever other uh, disease lesions uh, you know were uh, you know we saw on the plants. Um, so uh, resistance is usually defined as as being more absolute than something like tolerance, and so. I would say that they do not have resistance, but they do probably have some tolerance. Right. right. We have, when I say probably, they have. We have not tested them uh, in, uh, you know, in statistical trials to to show uh, unequivocally that that uh, the resistance is is there. As we compare, um, we make comparisons with controls. So, um, but we have seen in, uh, in observational trials that. Uh, you know, the uh, Scarlet Sunrise, for example, has has lower incidence of, of bacterial diseases and, and probably late blight too, or early blight rather, not late blight, early blight uh, than uh, you know some of the cultivars that are not um, adapted to New Jersey, and that's actually most of the cultivars. Most most tomato cultivars were were bred in either Florida or the West Coast. Uh, and you buy the seeds, and it may be the first time that that cultivar has ever seen the East Coast, um, at least in a very long time. So, um, so that's one of the advantages to all these uh, these cultivars that we're breeding and releasing here is that all the breeding work was done in New Jersey, and so they are adapted here, and they tend to have more tolerance to the diseases that are common here. So, Tom, is is there any tomato that you're aware of that is resistant to early blight? There is a resistance gene to early blight, um, but I think it's to a race that uh, is no longer that prevalent. And so I think there's a new race of, of early blight, as, as I recall, that uh, no, that, that a, a dominant resistance gene has not been found for yet. So. Um, so I think it'll probably be found, but um, I, I, uh, I believe that's, that's what the situation is now with, with early blight. All right, well, we're counting on you. All right, well, <laughs> you, you, can count, you can count on me. I, I can't guarantee anything, but. Because <clears throat> uh, I'm more interested really in, in multigenic resistance. I, I think that early blight, and that's what we select for. Um, you know, this monogenic resistance, as I said, intimated in the talk earlier, it's, it's unstable. It breeds the, it, it tends to breed the pathogen to become more virulent. And the, path, the pathogen can easily overcome dominant resistance because there's only one single gene. Uh, and then there's a, it becomes a new race. And now we have to you know, look for a new source of resistance. Seed companies don't mind this because uh, they're constantly you know, using their molecular technology to find new sources of resistance. And they use it in their marketing program. But um, you know, to me, it's creating a, a an untenable situation where we're we're um, we're producing more and more races of, of of these aggressive pathogens and making it more difficult for for farmers and gardeners to grow because we have so many races of pathogens out there. So I, I tend to favor uh, more of the horizontal resistance sources that uh, are going to be more more stable. Uh, you'll you'll tend to see a little bit more damage uh, in the crop, but um, you know uh, it'll it'll be less than the cultivars that are that are not adapted to um, New Jersey conditions, as I said before. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Amanda. Do, do we do we miss any questions? Ah. Uh let's see there's just a few uh joe would like to know what the um best disease resistant tomato to grow in new jersey would be is that uh like a, a large fruited type or, or uh or that wasn't specified but um perhaps maybe one or the other well there's a lot of f1 hybrids uh as, as i said earlier in the talk the f1 hybrids tend to have multiple disease resistance now a lot of those that disease resistance is not for diseases that are real real common in New Jersey. They're common in the West Coast or the South. Um, so when you're talking about um, you know, cultivars that are, are resistant uh, to uh, diseases that are common here, which uh, we mentioned early blight already and the, the bacterial uh, 
uh, foliar diseases like bacterial speck, bacterial spot. Um, every once in a while we do see late blight. We haven't, I don't think, seen a real outburst of it here in New Jersey for about 10 years. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, if, if uh, the, these, these commercial hybrids tend to, to be pretty clean. Uh, so if you're really looking for something that has, has multiple disease resistance, you know, something like, you know, red deuce or, um, um, uh, you know, some of the uh, North Carolinas, the Florida stuff coming up, Florida 47, uh, Mountain Fresh, uh, they, they tend to have higher, higher levels of disease resistance. But I don't think the fruit tastes very good, so. Fair enough. Win some, lose some with stuff like that, huh? But that's right, that's right. You know, it's uh, trying to get all these traits together and uh, uh, sometimes they fight against each other. I'm not saying that uh, the ones that are susceptible to disease taste better, but um, but you know it's uh, you know trying to get all these genes together in the in the in the in the same population is 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 a challenge. Right. And the, popu and, and the, and the pathogens change all the time. Absolutely. So it's a moving target. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so for um, the this tomato variety, is uh, Kathleen would like to know, is does it crack often as it grows and how much, I believe that you, she had a few questions. I believe you went over a few, um, but how thick is the, is the skin and then does it crack easily while it's growing are the first two questions. Not, uh, this, this cultivar, the, the skin is, is comparable to a, a, a red fruited grape which would say, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the differences between a grape and a cherry tomato, um, grapes generally have thicker skin. Uh, and so it does, does have thicker skin than, than, a, than a cherry tomato. But, um, you know, it's not noticeably thicker, uh, at least, uh, you know, from the, a sensory standpoint than, than, a, than a standard red type like, like Juliet or, or Smarty. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, it's uh, this this tomato, uh, the, the Scarlet Sunrise. I can, I've grown it for several years under some very adverse conditions, and I'm I'm pretty amazed at you know the fact that uh, you know we've we've had some very wet falls here, and uh, and I, I for the last few years I've been out there in November harvesting this this cultivar, and uh, and it's raining like crazy, and the, the field is muddy, and and these things just keep producing fruits that do do not crack. They do not crack while they're growing. They do not crack uh, when they're exposed to, to moisture. Uh, they're, they're about the most crack resistant grape that I've ever seen. That's awesome. That's good to know. Um, Kathleen also asked, uh, do you have to worry about uh, them when open pollinated uh, by the tomato plant and uh, changing the taste and growth of the Scarlet Sunrise? Well, the use of the term open pollinated in tomato is a bit uh, confusing because tomatoes mostly self pollinate. So um, you know, the term open pollinated was applied uh, constructively more towards plants that tend to cross pollinate, you know, they, they're like bee pollinated. Then you, you have to worry because uh, if you have an open pollinated cultivar and you're growing it, that and you're trying to save seeds, you might have a bee come in from the from next door, bring pollen in from another pepper cultivar or, or whatever, and and uh, and bring in unwanted genes to the population. But that's that's not really an issue with tomatoes because about 99% of the cultivars that are out there are almost entirely self-pollinated. Right. What that means is that uh, you know even if a bee came carrying some pollen. It's uh, it's just not going to work and land on a tomato flower, but it w w usually won't pollinate it because the the, the pollination has already taken place inside the, the flower and uh, inside the the anthrideal, uh, cone. So um, so open pollinated in tomato actually what it means is that it's it's kind of like an inbred, right? And it's not really going to change. You can you can harvest seeds from it year after year. And, uh, and, it, and it should not change. But if you did that with something like uh, peppers or um, you know, peppers about 50% cross-pollinated as compared to tomatoes. 
So if you try to do that with peppers, you could, you could have trouble. Right. And since we're, uh, we just reached six o'clock, I do have one more question from Joe saying that um, it, since we had such a cold spring this year, uh, when did you wind up planting the tomatoes? Well, not only did we have cold spring, we had a lot of other issues. So uh, we had, uh, we were late this year, mainly operationally trying to get off the ground. Um, now I, I can reach back, uh, uh, the processing tomatoes we put in this year, uh, which is an entirely different type of tomato. It's made for canning. We got those in all in April. Uh, now we had trouble. We had a lot of trouble with rains. You know, we had to dodge the rains to get them in. Uh, but I think our crop this year uh, of uh, grape tomatoes went in at the end of May, right around Memorial Day. Uh, now normally we'd want to go in sooner than that, but I think uh, this year it was a combination of, of the cool weather, the wet weather, and mainly coronavirus that, uh, you know, trying to you know, contend with all the, the regulations and restrictions. So uh, I don't think this year was particularly that, that the cool weather really put us that much behind. Fair enough. All right. All right. Well, we've reached six o'clock. And Tom, thank you very much. It was really an informative presentation. I think everyone learned a lot. Um, and we should try and figure out whether we can get some scarlet sunrises to these people. Because this seems Well, um, I, I, can, I can send uh, some seeds to you, Nagisa, and uh, if uh, you get requests, uh, and I'll send some along with some envelopes, and you can just send, you can send them out to folks that want to try it. Uh, yeah. You know, we're, we're not in this to make money. We, we just would like to, to get it out to people. Um, okay. Well, so, that's wonderful. Uh, I so, think everybody in the chat knows how to find us. So yeah, if you could send us some seeds, we'll definitely um, send them around to everybody who wants to try. It'd be fantastic. Okay. Well, I will send uh, maybe a couple thousand seeds to uh, to, to Nagisa, Great. and uh, with along with some coin envelopes. And then if she gets uh, requests, uh, you know, she can she can she can send the seeds out. I guess that's probably the best way to do it. Great. Great. Excellent. Fantastic. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Have a great evening, everybody. And tomorrow we have a cooking class. Um, Gabby's gonna be back. Our tasting teacher is gonna come back and teach uh, a tomato cooking. And um, so please come join us again tomorrow night. And um, we're looking forward to seeing everybody. All right, so Tom, thank you very much. All right, well, thanks everybody. Okay, have a great